Hello, friends, brothers from across the pond. I'm Nathan and I'm recording my book review for you. So the book that I've been asked to do is The Lord's Supper by Thomas Watson. Watson, as uh, you probably know, is an English Puritan. His dates are uh, 1620 to 1686. Now, most of you probably know him for his most popular work, The Body of Divinity. But I've been asked to do The Lord's Supper. Now, it turns out that it's actually quite a short book, but that's not the reason I chose it. Um, I hope that you don't think it is. Um, I actually chose the book because I've never read a book that is exclusively on the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and I was interested to do so. So largely it's a book that uh, focuses on uh, Matthew 26 um, and, and a touch there on 1 Corinthians 11 and 28, these passages dealing with the Holy Eucharist. Well, though it's a short book, it is rich and deep in spiritual content. It's theological, it's pastoral, and it's eminently spiritual. And so I'd first like to draw your attention to some of the theological aspects. We'll then move on to the uh, pastoral, and finally I'll give a sort of general overview and a little bit of feedback on the things that I've learned from the book. So the first is the theological. And I'd like to start by sharing with you what Watson would say is a false view of the sacrament. Now, you're probably aware, but there are the four uh, major um, thoughts on the way in which we're to understand the Lord's Supper. Uh, there's the transubstantiation, there's a memorialism, there's consubstantiation, and then there is Watson and Calvin's position on the sacrament. Watson doesn't deal with uh, consubstantiation here, but he does have something to say about memorialism and transubstantiation. So first, it's not a bare memorialism. Not a bare memorialism. The glorious ordinance writes Watson, is more than an effigy or representation of Christ. In the right celebration of it, the partaker has sweet communion with God. It is an ordinance that does not just show forth his beauty, but also sends forth his virtue. The partaker sees not just Christ, but he tastes Christ too. Any who hold to a position short of this, not just misunderstand the mystery of the sacrament, but come short of the comfort of the sacrament. And this is really Watson's concern. He acknowledges that there is a great spiritual benefit, a feast to be had in the Lord's Supper. And it grieves him to think that any would forego this. Um, with their false position. Secondly, it's not transubstantiation. The Roman Catholic position, Watson calls absurd and impious. It's absurd because it's contrary to both scripture and reason. So first, scripture. Christ's body, we're told, is locally and numerically in heaven, and therefore it can't materially be in the supper. That's impossible. And secondly, it's against reason itself. That the bread somehow transmits to us the actual body and blood of Christ whilst retaining its colour, form, taste and odour of the substance is madness. And secondly, not only is this position absurd, Watson writes, but it is also impious. The position that the bread itself transforms into the body of Christ 
assumes therefore that worship must follow, which of course leads to idolatry and sin. And furthermore, attached to this is the idea of the mass, that Christ is being re-crucified for the people. But of course, this is blasphemy and blasphemes the high priestly office of the Lord Jesus Christ, suggesting that his perfect sacrifice was imperfect. What a terrible thing. So what is the correct view of the sacrament? Well, the Lord's Supper, instituted by Christ, is both a healing and sealing ordinance, consisting in the taking of bread and wine, which when received in faith, feeds those who partake of it spiritually. How does Watson support the claim? Well, he says that first, it's instituted after Christ and the disciples had eaten, and therefore it cannot be to indulge the senses, but to feed the graces. Secondly, it's described in 1 Corinthians 10 and 16 as a real communion and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, and finally here, Christ blessed the elements. And when he blessed them, something of the nature of the sacrament was revealed. As he blesses it and he hands the corporal elements over to the disciples, clearly he is not saying that the, the physical parts transform into anything other than what they are, but that through his blessing, the disciples can receive Christ into their heart spiritually. So, I mentioned that it is both a healing and a sealing ordinance. But what does that mean? Well, to say that it is a seal is to say that those who worthily partake of it in faith, in faith again, receive grace, redemption, Christ and heaven. This is represented, Watson says, by the words, for the remission of sins, which is to be understood as a synecdoche. Uh, that is to say, the part that represents the whole. And so in saying this one part, we're to understand that all of the benefits that come through the covenant of grace and through the Lord Jesus Christ are to be received through this sacrament, that they are sealed to the believer by faith. And how is it that... Christ can do this. Well, Christ can do this, writes Watson, because he is the founder and source of grace. He has authority, therefore, to establish an ordinance whereby, when received in faith, the benefits of the covenant of grace are sealed to the believer. Secondly, what about those healing properties? Well, Watson claims that there are several of these healing benefits attached to the sacrament. The timing of its inauguration, just before Christ's crucifixion, is significant. It indicates that it was given as an antidote against fear and as a restorative to faith. So what are the healing benefits? Well, Watson talks of Christ satisfying the heart with sweetness and transmitting strength. Strength against temptations. Strength sufficient for work and for suffering. Partaking in the supper augments faith. It is for the increase of faith. The Old Testament manna um, is described as angels' food in Psalm 78. Well, Watson tells us that this is a lively type of Christ, but which he far exceeds, and that when we feast on Christ, we not only receive food, but that we receive a medicine that can heal all spiritual ills. The wine represents the blood of Christ, in which our life is rooted. And therefore, as you partake of the blood spiritually, it becomes an elevating thing to us. It has an elevating power that produces a vivacity in us, a life 
fullness. It's also a cleansing blood that can wash the crimson sinner milk white. And therefore, as you come, your conscience burning with heat, your heart hot within the cavity of your chest, in agony, Christ's blood comes like water to the fire as we partake of the sacrament. Isn't that so beautiful? Christ's cooling, regenerating blood given to the believer through the faithful receiving of this sacrament. And the final question is, what or who is it that makes the sacrament effectual? Well, on this, Watson says two things. He says that the supper is beneficial on account of what it represents, Christ and all his benefits, but that this is communicated to the believer through the operation of the Holy Spirit. This is seen as Christ prays over the elements, which Watson says is for the blessing and operation of the Holy Spirit to sanctify the elect and seal upon them all spiritual mercies and privileges. So that is the theological side to the book. And next we turn to the pastoral side. And Watson shows a tremendous concern for the people of God. Uh, this is reflected by the equal weighting in the book, if not more so given to his pastoral concerns. So I'd like to show you two things. Um, that firstly, Watson's concerns for the people are rooted in scripture. And secondly, governed by it as they're worked out in practice. So first, I'll show you that they are uh, rooted in scripture. Uh, one example of this is seen in Watson's assertion that the words of 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28 so let a man eat of the bread and drink of the cup are not only permissive, they're not only there to say we may come, but that they're to be read authoritatively, that all believers have a duty and a command to come and receive of this gracious sacrament. And not coming to the table, Watson tells us, is a gospel premier, which the editor helps in understanding what that word means. Well, it's akin to an act of treason against King Jesus. It is a rejection of his grace, and such a one is guilty and should be guilty of the blood of Christ, writes Watson. So his assertion here he makes is, is biblically founded. But then we see how, on this basis, he proceeds with his sort of practical outworkings and concerns. They're, they're governed by his biblical framework. And one of his methods here, in response to this assertion, is to come up with all possible objections that a person might raise um, to coming to the table. And I think that the extent of Watson's thought in this area um, surely must come from his many years in um, the pastorate, in working in ministry. He shows an absolute commitment to plead with the people of God for their benefit and for God's glory. So Watson suggests several, several objections as to why a person might not come forward to receive of the sacrament. Um, I can't share all of them, but I'll share just a few. One objection is the right acknowledgement that one is sinful and unworthy. And from this, they conclude that they have no such place in holy things. Well, Watson reminds the reader that sin should humble a person, but it must never discourage one from Christ. Christ himself invites the poor, halt and maimed, 
In fact, the more diseased a person is, the more infested with sin and frailty, the more they should come, says Watson, and step into the pool of Siloam. Another objection um, commonly uh, given is that of a person who has sinned presumptuously against mercy in knowledge of grace. Watson acknowledges that to sin in light of so much mercy and grace and such understanding um, and in the context of this sacrament being so visible and seen and understood by the people of God is a terrible thing. It is grievous to abuse mercy. But, says Watson, if our hearts are sincere, Jesus takes no advantage of every failing, but rather will drop his blood on such a one. That is, similar to Paul's situation in Romans 7, that if we have sincere hearts that are desirous to please the Lord, and yet in weakness, in foolishness, we fall into sin, Christ is not so quick as to condemn us but that he is fast to receive us back into his merciful and gracious arms. Now, these situations, they continue to escalate, becoming more and more intricate as Watson goes on. And it gets to a stage where there are those various people who say, but wait a minute, I do not feel any comfort in this ordinance. And Watson, well, he says, ah, ah, but there's strength. You may not feel comfort, but you, but you can be strengthened by the Lord in this ordinance. And then there's others who come and they say, well, I feel no joy. And Watson says, ah, but there are tears of repentance. You might not come and be filled with joy, but if you are shedding tears and you are remorseful over your sin, you're receiving benefit from this sacrament. Watson does not fail to come up with an encouragement for each and every situation. His heart is just given over to God's people. And then finally, finally, the situation is suggested of one that complains of no such fruit to be felt. Nothing at all. And Watson, you can almost hear his mind ticking around, not wanting the people to think that there is nothing to be gained through a right observing of this sacrament, answers, Ah, God's mercies in Scripture are not called speedy mercies, but sure mercies. And I almost laugh as he continues to find some pastoral exhortation for each and every situation. It's moving to read and see the thoughtfulness of Watson. So finally, I'd like to give a brief evaluation of the work as a whole, particularly sharing some of the things that I've gained from it. Well, I'd like to say this, that as a theological work, the book raises a number of significant questions concerning the Lord's Supper. In the most part, answers are given, but often they are handled in a brief and succinct manner, uh, which is helpful, which stimulates the appetite, but does not always satisfy. However, it's the pastoral side of the book that I found to be most helpful, that I was most affected by. There's a godly wisdom in Watson's attempt to meet the objections of those who will not come to the supper. There is a Christ-like tenderness as he ministers through the pages to the one who is weak in faith. For example, um, there's one stage where he gives six eminent marks of great faith as opposed to weak faith. He's trying to prove that this faith will come about through the observing of the sacrament. And so he lists these six marks of great faith. But as he gets to the end, he does not just sort of rubbish those believers who don't acknowledge this great faith in themselves. He says this, that infant believers 
having not attained great faith, need not be discouraged. For, in such a case as des described, if the faith be of a proper kind, it shall find acceptance. Watson concludes with magnificent beauty. A weak faith can lay hold of a strong Christ. Finally, Watson has an ability to plumb the depths of the soul. He writes that those who come to the table must do so with charitable hearts. And that it is a sad affair when those who profess they are going to eat Christ's flesh in the sacrament should tear the flesh of one another. The book's full of insights um, and application like this. And as I read this one Sunday afternoon, I, I was cut to the heart. We were actually going to partake of the supper later that day. And I was grieved. I was able to see this aspect to my own sinfulness um, that I just hadn't thought of, that had passed me by. But Watson's book tends to have that effect. It's, it's sanctifying, no doubt, by the Holy Spirit. But his words are searching words, and they almost leave no stone left unturned as he thinks of the pastoral and spiritual aspects of this sacrament. Well, in general, uh, the book, though short, is a profound meditation on the holy ordinance of the Lord's Supper. It promotes theological appetite, it appeals to the conscience, and serves as a practical guide to pastoral ministry. The writing style is clear and accessible, and it follows this elenctic format, the Q and A sort of system that you used to in the short catechism. And of course, that would lend itself perfectly to situations like family worship. Now, one final thing I'd like to say is that there is a strength in its brevity. And it's that it would be possible to read this book in a day, comfortably. And so actually, I did a lot of my reading, excuse me, um, on the, uh, the Saturday before the Lord's Day. Um, I, I did read it also on the Lord's Day, but it's perfectly possible to do the whole book in preparation as a preparatory reading for the Lord's Day and particularly for the taking of the Lord's Supper. It's a spiritual, um, engaging and emotive book and I would highly commend it to you. Um, I'd be happy to send you my full um, report. There are some, um, of course, other things that I couldn't possibly fit into the talk um, that hopefully uh, will be useful uh, to some of you. Anyway, um, it's nice to meet you almost, and um, I look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. God bless.